Hi there, my name is Dennis Province. I'm from the IDEA National Resource for Quantitative Proteomics, and I want to talk a little bit about experimental design and how it's related to doing a global proteomics experiment. Global proteomics has a goal to identify and quantify as many proteins as possible for a given set of conditions. Things to remember is that we try to limit the within group variability so that the biological variability which is the variability that you're trying to see between the two groups can be measured and compared. And the quantification that we get is actually relative. It can only compare the increase or decrease between two groups as it relates to the variability within the group. So a lot of times people will be confused and they're not exactly sure what type of experiment they need to run. There are two basic workflows that we have for global proteomics. The first one is a tandem mass tag or labeled experiment where we take these isobaric tags and we covalently bond them to each peptide in a particular sample. Now a TMT tenplex means that you can have 10 different labels to put on 10 different samples. Now in this experiment we still need to measure the variability within the group and we also need to measure the variability between the groups. So even though you have 10 tags, that doesn't mean that you're going to have 10 unique samples. Usually we would have two groups, a control versus a treatment, or a control versus a knockdown, for instance. Because statistics tells us where you might think, well, an N of 5 seems an awful lot. Maybe just an N of 3 is OK. But ex proteomic experiments it has been found from experience that an N of 5 or more is, is very valuable, especially if you have a tissue or some other uh, very uh, um, highly variable sample set. Cell culture sometimes, can, you can get away with an N equals 3. So this little graphic here shows you that in a TMT tenplex, you might have five samples that are all controls, where you have gone to great lengths to try to make each one of those samples uh, as similar as possible. And you've done, then you have five additional samples where maybe you've taken those cells or that tissue and you've um, treated it with something. And now you're going to compare those in your experiment. And so that in itself would be a single proteomic experiment, comparing those five controls versus those five treatments. Now the pros and cons of a, a TMT tenplex is, the, first of all, let's start with the pros. There are usually more proteins identified during a TMT experiment than a DIA. So that's good news. You get what we call deeper depth. You can also do phosphoproteomics. This allows the PI to study cell signaling pathways because it can tell you which serines, threonines, and uh, um, tyrosines are phosphorylated and which ones are most likely phosphorylated and which ones are not. Now the cons of a TMT experiment is the, what's called the missing value problem. So this is where you're missing data from one of the channels for that particular peptide. So if you don't have uh, uh, data for that particular peptide, then you can't count it in your experiment. Part of the problem, the reason for this, is that the analysis process is stochastic. That means it's random somewhat, so that sometimes very low abundant peptides that are very near the threshold of measurability are seen in one sample, but not in another. And so that causes the missing values. The other con for a TMT tenplex is that it has a limited number of samples. TMT or the labeled experiments really is late. Uh, we suggest that if you have 20 samples or less that you could use a TMT uh, technology. Otherwise, if you have more than that, we would suggest using DIA. Now for a DIA or data independent acquisition analysis, the sample size can be 20 or more. It can be less than 20, but usually larger sample sizes are seen for DIA experiments. The same thing occurs though. We need to measure the variability within the group so that we can measure the variability between the groups. So if you had 20 samples, the number that you would uh, could have for say a voucher in our, our proteomic voucher program, then you could divide four, you could have four different groups, like for instance, a control and a disease versus a treatment. 
where you'd still have an n equals 5. So it might look something like this. Your typical DIA experimental design for 20 samples might be having five samples of your control. That might be like a certain cell type that's normal. And then you have that same cell type that is diseased somehow, maybe because you've knocked out some gene or there's been some mutation. And then you've taken those control um, cells and you've added some sort of treatment to them. And then you've done the same thing with the disease state. And you can see that now we can have four different comparisons. We could have more than four, but the four most meaningful comparisons would be the control versus the treatment, the control versus the disease to see the proteomic differences when you knock out or have that mutation. And that's not just going to show you that that mutation, the, 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 say for instance, the particular protein that has changed, but all the other uh, proteins um, that are going to be affected because of that. And then you can also have uh, some other comparisons like the diseased versus the um, treatment and then the diseased or the treatment control versus the treatment diseased. Hopefully your treatment, which is trying to fix whatever the disease was, is not going to damage and change the proteome of your control cells. Now, the pros and cons of a DIA experiment, starting with the pros, are that as I said, you're not limited on the number of samples. So whereas in this demonstration, I was talking about just having 20 samples, you could have an N of a thousand or more as possible for a DIA experiment. It's a great method for clinical studies where you have large batches of uh, uh, clinical samples. And the variability within the group, a lot of times with those clinical samples is greater which means that you might have uh, 20 people that are considered to be normal, but each one of those people, samples from those people are not very similar. So whereas they are in the normal group, their variability is greater. And then the, you might have another group that would be the diseased group, and then that would also have greater variability within the group. So you would want your, your small n to be greater, greater than 5, maybe even greater than 10, so that you can get an accurate measurement of the variability within the group so that you can um, be able to see the differences between the groups. DIA also doesn't have the missing value problem. Uh, the way that the data is collected, um, they run a reference library first. So if we're going to see the peptides, we're going to see them in every one of the samples. It's very robust that way. Now the cons of DIA is that it can't identify as many proteins as a TMT experiment. So you get about 80 or 85 percent for the same amount of instrument time as you would a TMT experiment. And normally you phosphoproteomics is not done with this method. Are you ready to get started? If you would point your browser to idearesourceproteomic.org and you look down at the bottom of the page, you'll see that we have voucher applications there. These voucher applications are uh, for you to fill out. It's a short two-page uh, application and you could receive free proteomics in the form of a 10-plex TMT experiment or a 20-plex or a 20 sample DIA experiment, very similar to the one that I just pointed out here. Now, October 15th is the due date for this round, and the next round of vouchers is February 15th. And that happens three times a year. So if you're looking to get into proteomics and you want a cheap way of doing it, it doesn't get any better than this. Hope to see your application soon. Thanks for listening.